Facebook. A warm welcome to everyone. And thank you for joining us today. In fact, lunchtime for many of you and evening for some. My name is Sophie Lambin and I'm the editor partner for the Women's Forum for the Economy and Society. Your host today, the Women's Forum, is a global platform for action to highlight women's voices and vision and build a more inclusive economy and society. In collaboration with the New York Times, we are hosting the first in a series of live conversations with women leaders. Women from around the world, women on the front lines, women leading us through the crisis. I hope that today you will find inspiration. Inspiration on the part we can all play to build a more inclusive world and a more resilient future. As part of this conversation, we will be hosting a virtual conference on May 28th with a call to action to the G7. Our focus will be on how women leadership can help us to design a better world, from access to health and climate action, to technology for good, inclusive AI and women entrepreneurship. We warmly invite you to register. A quick note on audience questions. We will, we will be taking as many as we can through the live chat on your screen, so please submit them. You can also follow the conversation on social media with the hashtags Woman for Inclusion and In Her Words. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Francesca Donner, the New York Times Gender Director and Editor of In Her Words, the Gender Column. Francesca will lead a discussion today with a remarkable guest. Francesca. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here um, talking about a very difficult subject matter. We know that the virus is killing men at higher rates than women, but as the European Institute for Gender Equality framed it, women and men are facing different realities in light of this pandemic. Today, we are going to unpack some of the different realities and inequities with Fumzile Malambo Nguka, she doesn't really need an introduction, but nevertheless, she is, as you know, the Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. She has also held several positions in the South African government, most recently Deputy President, where she focused in particular on the fight against HIV, AIDS, poverty, and education. Welcome, everybody. Fumzile and I are going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then we will open it up to questions. Fumzile, are you ready for your first question? Yes, uh, good evening. All right, here goes. Um, we're going to start uh, with some of the specifics, um, talking about how COVID has, and this pandemic has really um, affected women in very specific ways. And then we're going to um, look at some of the broader issues. So I wanted to start actually with um, the economic problem. Um, it's really far ranging. And it's clear that almost everyone is suffering economically right now. But women all over the world earn less than men and are more likely to be working in underpaid and undervalued jobs. And really, that's just the tip of the economic iceberg. I'm curious, how do you see the pandemic playing out long term for women versus men? And what would you like to see governments and other leaders do to offset the imbalance? Yeah, um, uh, thank you so much uh, for the question. As you probably know, every pandemic has a gender dimension. There is nothing like a gender neutral pandemic and this one is not different. Women are affected, not just by the virus or the disease itself, but by the circumstances uh, surrounding uh, the way the, 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 the response is handled. In this case, whether we provide the stimulus that are targeted to women's businesses, uh, women are, are dying in this case also in large numbers, uh, not because of the disease, they are dying because they are employees, they work in the kitchen, they work in the laundry, they clean, they are the majority of nurses, so they are the ones who are in the front line in that way. In Spain, for instance, 72% of uh, 
health workers who have died on duty uh, are, are women. And of course, uh, women also are affected by the uh, unpaid care responsibility uh, because uh, as they continue to provide service, if they are healthcare workers, they are still providing services at home, looking after their families. If there's a spillover of sick people who can't go to hospital, it is the women at home who are looking after those people. Uh, girls, uh, in many countries, we are seeing a spike in trafficking of girls. We are very much concerned about girls not going back to school after the schools have closed for this long time. A, a high teenage pregnancy in early marriage. So the circumstances, not just the disease, uh, are a worry. And all of this shrink the women's uh, economic uh, potential in society for the long term. If they've become pregnant in this time, that is the beginning of a journey of poverty for most girls. If at this time they are trafficked, you know, they are lost to society and their rights will be violated in unimaginable way. And of course, uh, as you said yourself, uh, they are in low paying jobs, they are in the informal sector, they are not in jobs where they can enforce a contract. Uh, in that way, uh, even when there's a stimulus and packages that are given to their employers, uh, they are not in a strong position to demand uh, that uh, they are also counted. It needs us to make the case to governments that when you provide the stimulus, when you provide a package to an employer, you must make sure that they treat women well, that women benefit, that women are not discriminated because they are casual workers. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, you mentioned so many things and I think maybe it, it, it is worth taking a moment to drill down on some of those things um, a little more deeply. Um, one of the things you mentioned was women, of course, on the front lines. Uh, we know that around the world, women comprise the more majority of healthcare workers. Um, by some accounts, it's around 70%, especially in the nursing professions. Yes. We also know, as you pointed out, that they're ma the majority of caregivers for the sick, which puts them at risk once again. So I'd love to hear from you, whether paid or unpaid, how can or should governments and policies look after these women who are on the front lines? They've been so squarely placed in harm's way. And I'm also curious to hear from you, in many instances, they're in harm's way because of entrenched social norms. It's the women who do those caregiving roles. So is it time in your mind to start changing those social norms? What yeah. would you like to see at sort of the social level and at the government or leadership level? Now, firstly, just by uh, ensuring that women are represented in decision making of the health profession. Uh, I just looked at a, a, a program uh, on Nurses Day last, last week, I think it was, and everyone who was a spokesperson of a major organization of nurses in, this pro in that program was a man. And I was just asking myself, how is this? possible. Uh, we have women who are formidable nursing professionals and they are even within this segment they are not represented or they are not leading, they are not the spokesperson. Women need to be in the planning of their response in the human resource uh, discussions about how what the conditions of service uh, are for, for, for women who are employed in the, in the health sector. We know now, uh, if in case anyone did not know, that health workers are an essential service, but their conditions of service do not reflect that. We need to look at their remuneration. Uh, we actually also look at the safety uh, uh, surrounding the, the, the work they do, not just in the times of COVID, but in general. Uh, so I think that uh, the presence of women uh, on high tables would actually make a difference, especially women who go through the ranks. They know exactly what it is like uh, not to be uh, uh, supported in a way you expect to be supported at, at, at the workplace. I also think that uh, uh, when women uh, also are providing unpaid care, 
while they are also on duty, they give a lot of time to their patients, uh, to their responsibilities uh, of work. I would argue that governments need to provide these women uh, also some relief packages in the same way that we are providing with businesses so that they can afford care for their children because otherwise they are rushing to work, rushing to home. Most of them use public transport, which also exposes them to greater infection because they cannot afford private transport because at the levels at which they are employed, they are not uh, the people who would own their own car. Right. I mean, I think you, you just can't... All of these issues are so incredibly tangled, but it's almost impossible to look at what is happening without really addressing the unpaid care that you just talked about. Um, you know, for our audience, that's things like caring for family, cooking, cleaning, basically all the thankless tasks that women do, uh, the majority of all over the world. Um, and frankly, those are the things that allow our formal economies to exist as, as they do. Um, you know, exactly. And actually, the women contribute to for 2.5% of the global GDP through their unpaid care. I mean, there has to be something that can be done to redistribute that, to recognize it, and to, re to remunerate it in some way. That also means that employers uh, must look at how men and women's division of labor is at the workplace because there's a continuum when women uh, go back at home. So that is why parental leave is not a small issue. It goes a long way towards determining what is going to happen at home. We are likely to go to a situation where many people are going to be working from home for the long term. We do not want to end up having employers deciding that, you know what, if we're, we're, we're reducing our staff so that you can social distance in the offices, the people we are likely to allow to work at home are going to be women because then you'll be reinforcing the stereotype. There has to be some rotation that allow both parents in the household uh, to have time to work from home and to learn to work to work sitting at the, in the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree. Um, you know, I, I think there are just so many ways to look at it and so many parts of that, whether, you know, you've mentioned parental leave, um, you mentioned remuneration, um, it could be childcare. I can't think of any country that has really, really solved the problem of childcare. It could be simply um, changing those social norms that men, of course, they change the diaper and of course they, you know, handle the homeschooling. So in your mind, bearing in mind, of course, you probably want all of these things, where do we start um, in terms of thinking of social safety nets? Um, wh which issue would you even pick up first? Uh, well, firstly, I think we must make sure that all countries have legislation that protects all the rights of women. I, I really cannot choose uh, which rights we, we need to sacrifice. So firstly, it just starts with legislation that covers uh, all the women so that women have recourse. Countries may not uh, afford in some cases uh, to live up to the obligations in relation to all the right, rights uh, that uh, they, they, they have already uh, made available. But it's important that they, they, those rights are there in law. Economic well-being and economic independence of women is important because uh, the lack of uh, economic independence goes a long way towards uh, uh, putting women in a situation where they cannot uh, take themselves out of harm's way. They think about the, the needs of children, they think about themselves, they think about shelter, etc. So we need to make sure that we give women a better chance to fend for themselves and to make decisions that are important to them. The pandemic of gender-based violence, that's a shadow pandemic, uh, which is there now, but it was there before uh, COVID-19. It will be there after. We actually need our responses to uh, uh, COVID-19 to address this issue for the long term. We are flattening the curve of the, of the, of the pandemic. We must flatten the curve of gender-based violence 
at the same time as well and stay with it until we've been able to see a, 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 a difference. So yeah, we, I, I want all those things to, to happen. And it's not impossible to drive these things because it's not like uh, one takes from the other. They are mutually reinforcing if you intend to actually push forward with the addressing the, 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 the gender status of women. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you raised violence because it is just devastating the world over and it doesn't matter who you are, or what country you're in, it's happening. And to me, the way I sort of looked at it, um, particularly now, is violence is the surprise public health crisis that really is no surprise at all. It always goes up when families are together and lockdown creates an ample opportunity for abusers and that's exacerbated by stress and loss of control. And now we see governments scrambling to address the crisis. How can it have been a surprise? How do we make sure it's not a surprise next time? It's shocking to me that it is a surprise. What do you think? Well, it, it certainly, you are right, it certainly could not be a surprise because uh, every time there is a, a crisis, uh, this is what happens. We saw it in Ebola. Uh, it, was, it was the same. And you cannot uh, limit access to services at a time like this. Our call to governments is that the services that women need uh, to prevent as well as to protect themselves from violence must be declared essential service in every country so that there's a passage into the home where women may need help from home and a passage to go out to go uh, to, to, to seek help. And it has to stay an essential service because it will always it will always be essential until we have been able to bend the curve of uh, gender-based uh, violence. And that is what, why we are calling for building better. That uh, the reconstruction must not be about going back to the old normal. We want to go back to the new normal, which is not going back to the status quo that we had before COVID. We cannot go back to, a, to countries that have digital divide to the extent that there are children who cannot go to school. We cannot go back to countries where essential services for women affected by violence are something, is, is, is a service that some can get, but most women cannot have it. We can also not go back to an economic system in which women are at the bottom and there is no clear mechanism and ladders to get women out of that situation. And G7 countries are in a unique position to lead the change of building better, to actually bring at a G7, G20 level, United Nations, an ethos of building better. Um, it's interesting to hear you say that. I, you know, it's, I just want to share one thing. In the course of our reporting on COVID and gender at the Times, we've heard many argue that now is not the time to worry about women. When we have people dying, we have vaccines to develop, we have a real crisis on our hands. I'm going to venture a guess and say that you would argue that now is the time to worry about Absolutely. women. But I'm, I'd like to hear from you, how do you convey that message to a world that either does not or cannot see that? Because I, I'm really quite serious, we've heard that argument from all types of people and academics and on Twitter and all sorts of places, it, it is a quite consistent argument. Let's just not worry about that. We've got bigger things to deal with. So, so how do you counter that, Fumtile? Well, I think you have to break it down for them. Uh, one of the essential uh, uh, way of uh, fending off the, the, the virus, for instance, is washing hands and clean water. There are many countries where women are the people who actually have to walk looking for water. In many cases, bring back home dirty water. And that takes a lot of their time and that takes them away from engaging in other economic activity. If you address this issue of water, which is good for everyone's health, the woman's family herself, and frees up her time for some other thing, that is good, we need that now. The crisis needs that uh, to, be, to be present. If you're talking about uh, gender-based violence, there's never a good time to beat up a woman, I'm sorry. 
whether it, we are in a crisis or not, we have to use every opportunity to address this issue and to intervene in a way that will make our intervention permanent. If you're thinking about access to uh, a, a digital infrastructure that would uh, uh, enable more women to have a, a meaningful future in their work life, that will enable all children to go back to school and the girl children also to have access to technology because there's still a, a, a gender divide also when it comes into access to technology. Why must we say the girls must be left behind? The girls, we've worked so hard for girls' education, for goodness sake. We cannot give up even now. Now is not the time to say we must relax and let girls be trafficked and let uh, uh, child marriage uh, go, go rampant because we're fighting a disease. This is just as bad. And fighting these uh, different uh, 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 different ways of the, where women are oppressed does not take away from the fight from for health. These things go together. Maternal health. We fought so hard for maternal health. It is now high at risk because of where we are and what is happening to our health system. Should we say that women who are giving birth now must 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 die because we're helping uh, women who are women and men who are infected? We need both to happen. Uh, no, that, that argument is not credible. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. So um, I'm going to ask you one or two more questions and then we'll go to our audience questions. Um, I know you've been thinking a great deal about, um, about building back with inclusion. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about that as well. Um, just as just as a quote for some of our, our audience to think about, um, Devi Sridhar, who's chair of global health at the University of Edinburgh Medical School, wrote in an op-ed um, in the British Medical Journal that the only way to avoid groupthink and blind spots is to ensure representatives with diverse backgrounds and expertise are at the table when major decisions are made. Fumzile, I'm pretty sure you agree with that because you made the same point earlier in our chat. Um, but I want to hear from you, if we can, talk in quite concrete specifics about how you get women and other underrepresented groups and people at the table. It's very hard culturally and socially. It doesn't just happen overnight. <laughs> we don't have a historical precedent of it. So how do we make that happen? This is kind of an interesting turning point when things could change or they could just go back to the way they are. Um, so I would love to hear from you your thoughts on on that and making it happen. Yeah, in fact, uh, the UN Secretary General has said that uh, we are facing a, a situation where the modest uh, gains that women have made can either be stalled or we could lose some of the gains, which is even worse. So now is the time for us to push forward rather than to move uh, uh, backwards. We actually need to engage men in authority and power. And uh, as, as much as we do not have uh, enough men who stand up for women's rights, but we've seen a critical mass of men who are willing to use their power and authority to make decisions that promote gender equality. This is the time for them now to do everything that they can to bring about uh, the changes. I don't think that uh, we have time for incremental change. And frankly, we are just so impatient. Uh, we actually need to use the crisis to make the decisions that can be enforced, that can be enshrined in laws and in policies, that can be implemented with and, and provide both carrots and stick. Uh, for people uh, who are responsible for oversee those decisions uh, to, to, to do the work. If you imagine how in a sh in few days the world turned around, no one was ready to make all the changes that we've had to make in this last few days. You can force that level of reaction, not by uh, 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 working on a step-by-step -step because we don't have step-by-step. -step. Those that have decisions, governments have overnight uh, 
and and governments by the way don't all don't have a fiscal space in most countries we we were seeing just before the crisis every government was concerned about their economic status but overnight just like that they all had solutions we need that level of commitment to gender equality for them to find decisions because all the problems that women are facing all of them have a solution the solution there's a solution to gender-based violence men must stop beating up men women and there's, there's a police force and their responsibility they are employed to protect citizens to react when there's a transgression and to take action that becomes corrective they, so you know so the easy way to to minimize at least economic exclusion of women there is a response that is effective that can be taken by individual companies uh, in order to bring women to the leadership, in order to uh, also engage and pay women better, they, 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 there's an answer to that. So women's problems have solutions. Right. I think we have some questions from our audience. Uh, Sophie, yes, do have- we do. We do, Francesca. Uh, we have had some really good questions coming through. So um, let me first um, go to the question that Sofia Merlo submitted. Sofia Merlo is an executive member of the executive committee and soon to be a head of HR for BNP Paribas. She's also a member of the Women's Forum Strategic Committee. So Sofia asks us, uh, the he for she program that the UN woman has spearheaded has been incredibly impactful in both engaging men and creating a big global conversation about the efforts to drive quality and inclusion. Is UN Women considering increasing men's engagement even further through more coalition like he for she? Yes, uh, we are increasing and in fact, we are doing it. We have now also uh, uh, announced a program, uh, I mean an intervention, he for she at home, in order to make sure that this is not just a campaign for men to uh, address uh, gender equality at work, we want them to also uh, practice this at home. But uh, in the next round of our activities for He For She, we actually want to uh, bring in a, a lot of grassroots and ordinary people, but also many more sectors uh, in the economy, in different professions to take part and become He For She's. But we also want to encourage different men's organizations, people forming their own organizations and their own initiative where they can push, support, encourage men to demonstrate a more constructive masculinity and support for for gender equality. And they will not be thanked for doing that because this is a good thing to do for society and for humanity. We will not praise the fishes for swimming. We just want them to do the right thing. Thank you. Francesca, shall I give you another one? I think we should go with another one. Yes. Yep. So Jenny Mardi, founder of Women Let's Talk Louder, with regard to the African continent, how can we make changes regarding women leadership when we know that culture is the main obstacle? How do we change the mindset? Well, I don't think that uh, this issue of women's leadership uh, is a global issue. Uh, I think uh, the uh, the shortage of of women leaders uh, is 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 all over. Africa is at bad times and worst time. We have more women leaders at uh, uh, ministers and uh, members of parliament level in Africa, but we don't have heads of states. So we we need to to push Africa to move from just having women at a ministerial level and to get them to also move it at, at heads of states. In Europe, we need to push more women to become members of parliament. In some countries, we need to push more women in the private sector. So we need to pull together uh, uh, our, uh, I mean, we need to make our engagement something that uh, is shared between and amongst uh, regions of the world. But in those countries where we have culture is also an important and and, 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 and a strong uh, barrier. We actually need to work with cultural leaders. So in Africa as UN Women, we have actually organized a, a pan-African organization of cultural leader called COCTA. These are, uh, are cultural leaders and, and chiefs who believe who don't believe in child marriage, 
uh, who believe in keeping girls at school, uh, who also believe uh, in uh, 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 girls uh, taking leadership and women taking leadership position. And at this time, we are working with them to also be the messenger that goes to community to educate people about COVID. But in general, when it's time for election, it's time for campaigning, we also use them a lot to support women candidates and to encourage them. Just, just but I don't want people to relax in other parts of the world. Everybody has homework when it comes to women's leadership everywhere in the world. There isn't a good country as far as that is concerned. We need to work together on it. Well, I, I'm going to I'm going to interject just one second because um, it, I've been thinking a lot about female leadership as well, and and many people have actually made the case that female-led countries have steered um, their nations through this virus more efficiently and more effectively. Um, New Zealand, Finland, Germany come to mind, while other nations led by men have been bogged down with delays and inaction and plenty of war rhetoric. My colleague at the Times, actually, Amanda Taub, suggested in a column last week that this could change perceptions of what strong leadership looks like. So, from Zile, on the heels of that, uh, what does strong leadership look like to you today? Well, I think it's what a strong she, leadership. What does she look like to you today? Yeah. Uh, uh, strong leadership is actually focused on the purpose why are you leading you are leading because you want to address the needs of people and these women you have highlighted of these countries that have done well in fighting the pandemic have been super focused on the pandemic no time for petty politics no time for using this politics to uh, to score a point about something that has nothing to do with it with with, with the pandemic and super careful on making sure that every step they take it leads them to the results that are needed to make the changes. I think women also know a lot about how you take care of people who are in pain because this is a disease that affects families. This is a disease that brings a lot of grief when there is fatalities in families. And I think they have been able to uh, balance all those issues, uh, being firm on how you deal with the resources that you have, on how you enforce the regulations that you made, but also be caring and make sure that your eyes are on saving lives. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not saying that men do not have those qualities, uh, but I think women have it more. They are blessed with those qualities more than men. Sophie, do we have another question? Yes, uh, we actually have uh, a, a lot and it's a very difficult choice uh, to make. Um, so I'm going to go with this one. Um, Nicola Ellerman, CEO of Ellerman Consulting. Women in supply chains have been suffering particularly as they have difficult working conditions. They've often been laid off and may suffer in the future from even lower salaries or more difficult working conditions as the capacity to negotiate safety and salary and even shelter is lowered. What can be done to avoid the increased fragility? Yeah, um, I think this is an issue that will also need a strong participation of women in trade unions. Uh, because trade unions also tend to be masculine. Uh, uh, they will not, auto it's not automatic that they will fight for these issues uh, that impact uh, on women. Uh, but of course, uh, they also have policies that support gender equality, etc. But you need women need to be there to make sure that they are the ones who are driving the agenda that that, that benefits them. So I would say more than anything else, that is going to be uh, uh, important. But also, women who are elected to positions because we may, there may not be elections in the meantime in different countries, but women that are there in positions of authority. They really need to be the people who are using the, the, the high tables that they are sitting in to address the issues that affect women. We as UN Women are trying to issue policy briefs and guidances that women can use in different countries in order to direct themselves to the area where they can best intervene and create a relief 
bring about relief uh, for, for women in different ways. And I think uh, people of different professions who have an insight in what is happening in the different sector, we really need them to raise their voices and speak on, on, on behalf of women. And again, I go back to men because they have the monopoly of power. We need them to look at how they could uh, protect and support women. Right. Um, we've gone massively over time. <laughs> So um, forgive me for taking so much of it, so much of your precious, precious time. Um, I'm going to um, conclude our conversation with um, a question that you will probably dislike because um, you will have many, many answers for it. But um, I'm going to ask it anyway and uh, let's see how it goes. So. I want to take into account all that we've discussed today and ask you, Fumzile, what needs to happen to build back better? And before you begin, we are not allowed to stay on this call for another hour or two. So if you don't mind, let's, if you possibly can, think of one or two things that are absolutely the top priorities on your list. What needs to happen to build back better in your mind? I will go with the leadership of women. Let us try and position women in strategic leadership so that they are inside the rooms where decisions are being made and trust them to make the right decisions for all of us. So let's just get them inside the door. Brilliant. Wonderful. Thank it's you. Like, Thank you so much, uh, nice. Fuzile and Francesca, uh, for this uh, fascinating conversation. I think I will leave you with everybody has homework to, to do when it comes to women empowerment. I think we clearly uh, leaving this conversation with a sense of what we can all uh, contribute to do to build uh, that inclusive future. Um, for those of you uh, who have joined us, um, thank you so much for, for your presence, for your questions. I'm sorry we were not able to go through all of them. If you have missed anything, the recording of this conversation will be available here uh, very soon. Uh, obviously, from Zile, we're looking forward to, um, to having you back at our virtual conference on the May 28th. As a reminder to our audience, uh, you can register by clicking on the links at the top right corner of the page. But let me uh, take this opportunity to thank you again many, many times over, Francesca from Zile. Thank you uh, for your um, participation and thank you to our audience for being there. We're looking Thank forward you. to seeing you back again very soon for our next uh, conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.